Well, yesterday there was a board meeting to discuss San Diego State's membership in the Mountain West. And here we are, with no news. Why? You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your, nor- your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free and beloved conference of champions. Like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show. I'm going to be so happy to share a piece of news later in the show. Make sure you stick around for that. And then we have a couple big questions to ask with regarding the Pac-12. But the biggest one right now is what's happening with the media deal. What's going to happen? What's it going to look like? How much is it going to be worth? Okay, those are questions, plural, but it's all kind of, you know, packed into one singular question of what is going to happen. And then the biggest question, number two, when is it going to happen? So yesterday was one of these kind of soft deadlines that I told you for all you everydayers out there to be aware of a while back. Now, another thing that I said at the time, and I was correct, is look at these deadlines as not deadlines, but guidelines. You know, like in Pirates of the Caribbean, the code is more like guidelines than actual rules. Well, the December, or December, how did that happen? I don't know. The July 17th and July 21st deadlines, quote unquote, are more like guidelines for the Pac-12. Because yesterday, there was a meeting, at least that was what was on the, uh, the schedule, of the board of directors of the Mountain West Conference, Adela De La Torre, the president of San Diego State, was not a part of said meetings. And reportedly, they were discussing San Diego State's membership in the conference. And yet here we are with no news. Meaning what exactly? Well, the way it seems is that, remember that whole back and forth and this battle of, you know, verbal jargon and legalese and all this sort of stuff and did they leave or did they not leave? Are we treating it this way? Are we treating it that way? And everything like that. And then their membership, according to uh, Navarez, the commissioner of the Mountain West, was going to be discussed yesterday at the meeting and then here we are on july 18th with no deadline again it kind of seems like san diego state was given an extension now whether or not they might have to give something in return for getting that extension because the pac-12 is not able to figure this stuff out or has not figured it out yet at this point in time That remains to be seen. Most of the things that we all want to know, that we are curious to know, remain to be seen. So for the Pac-12, the question of San Diego State is still in play. As of now, as of my time recording this show, and most likely as the time this show airs, San Diego State is still in play for the 2024-25 athletic season. I don't think they even have a schedule set beyond 2024 so you know they have future uh, non-conference matchups with Pac-12 schools actually I think Washington State and Oregon State are are, are on there I forgot to double check that but they, they have Pac-12 opponents on their schedule as non-conference so that could become conference one day would they have to turn that stuff around yeah they they, they, they would figure all of that out and whatnot but bringing it back to to what's happening right now we're in the same spot that we were Nothing's changed. And once again, anytime we get these deadlines, hints, indications, days to watch for, anything like that, we end up, at least so far, having nothing materialize on that day. And so we are once again brought back to a lesson that I have stated, shall we say, repeatedly on the show but is worth bringing up again because here it is relevant again. And that is that the people who are making these decisions, commissioners, presidents, 
chancellors, media people are really, really, really unconcerned for the most part with what we all think. They might care a little, but they don't care a lot. Because if they cared a lot, they'd push the envelope to try and get something done. But they don't appear, at least that's how it seems to us outsiders, they don't appear to be in a massive hurry. And everyone was all, you know, concerned, like, oh, what are you going to do when the June 30th deadline passes? You won't be able to get an extension. They're not going to give you that. Well, here we are. It's July 18th. And San Diego State's membership was discussed yesterday. Now, the next day to watch, because this is how this stuff works. Isn't it fun? It's great. I'm loving it. I love it here. Anyway, I do actually love it here. I love doing the show for all of you. By the way, on that note, we hit 3,000 subscribers on YouTube recently. It was a goal of mine to reach that before the season started, and we hit that in the middle of July. Cannot say thank you enough. Appreciate you all for watching the show. If you have not already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you listen or watch. Anyway, so the next thing to watch for is that the Pac-12 media days are three days from now. Really exciting. On a Friday. Just like our conference championship game. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know. Don't ask me. I didn't plan it. Anyway. <laughs> this year, it being on a Friday could actually work out, which I'll get to in just a sec. Well, actually, here's why. Friday is widely seen. There was a point in time in my life where I was not going to work in, in sports broadcasting and media. I was going to go uh, work in politics instead. And there was a, a term that I'd come become familiar with that many people are as well of Friday news dumps where when you have something that you have to release, but you don't want it to get the maximum amount of attention, you release it on a Friday because people are more distracted because they're thinking about the weekend. So if the Pac-12 is going to have its media day without a media deal to be done, having it on a Friday could actually be advantageous because you'll at least tamper down at some level as, as best you can. Not entire. I'm not saying entirely. I'm just saying by like a fraction of an amount. I don't know how much, but just generally speaking, it's not going to make as big a head, as big a news on, you know, a, a Friday as it would on say a Monday. Anyway, so the next day to watch for though, before media day later this week is tomorrow because tomorrow is when the mountain west has their media days and you know who's going to be going to be speaking there gloria navarez she is the commissioner of the mountain west conference and i don't know about all of you but if i were in attendance at mountain west media days and i had heard from the conference previously that the membership of a key institution such as San Diego State was going to be discussed on Monday and we didn't hear anything about it on Tuesday and then Wednesday rolls around and it's a press conference. If I were a reporter or a journalist or media person sitting in that room, that would be probably somewhere in the ballpark of the first question I would ask. I think it would be near the top of the list. It would also probably be the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth question I asked. <laughs> because that's kind of the most interesting thing about the conference right now is, are you about to lose Southern California and a program whose men's basketball team just went to the national championship game? Are you about to lose them to the Pac-12? What was discussed? What was said? These are questions that I'm sure will get asked tomorrow. And I will be following along. But I waited all day to record this show. I could have recorded it at any point. In day. Well, there was some construction going on, so not all, all day. But anyway, I could have recorded it at most points in time during the day today. But I waited because I was like, well, I got to wait and see what happens with the board meeting. And nothing happened. So we're just going to have to wait again, which is just SOP for the Pac-12, man. Standard operating procedure. Here's a day. Watch for it. And also, once it arrives, we're going to kick the can down the road. I tell you, San Diego State, they belong in the Pac-12 as much as anybody of the 10 remaining teams, um, as much as any one of them. I mean, that's that's quintessential, isn't it? Like, you're not a real Pac-12 member until you kick the can down the road on realignment and uh, media rights stuff. I have a piece of news to report. Well, news, update, whatever you want to call it. 
that I'm really happy about. You're going to be really happy if you go check out FanDuel, too, because that's America's number one sports book. And you can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. You just bet 20 bucks and you land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. Betting Shohei Otani would be a good idea. All in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. There's no better place to bet Major League Baseball or anything you want in the Pac-12. <laughs> I'm going to get to this FanDuel and uh, betting stuff in, in just, just a moment. But you need to go sign up today first at FanDuel.com slash locked on to be a part of America's number one sports book. Get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, we've we've done our second segment sip. Spencer, you seem gleeful. Spencer, you seem you seem chipper. Why do you seem so chipper? You're the host of a show whose conference, of which the show is about, still doesn't have a media deal. Media day is three days away. It's gonna be a PR disaster. Oh, it could be a PR disaster, but you know, again, that ship's that ship kind of sailed a while ago. But also, don't we also kind of want the deal to not get done until after the media day? Just because we're all curious what George Klyovkov would have to say. Don't we kind of want that to happen? Just a little bit. Just to see how he answers the questions. Just just to see. Anyway. anyway. Spencer, why are you in such a chipper mood? Because I was perusing our friends at FanDuel not long ago. Because I saw something that I thought at first was a typo. But then I learned, after doing diligent research, that it is not. FanDuel has adjusted their lines. Now, I have used this graphic for quite a while here on the show, for those of you on YouTube. It's the Pac-12 2023 over, over under win totals. You can bet all of them at FanDuel. For those of you listening on podcasts, they go as follows. At 9.5 wins, we have USC, Oregon, and Washington. At 8.5 wins, we have UCLA, Utah, and Oregon State. Washington State at six and a half, four and a half a piece for Arizona State, Cal, and Arizona. Stanford at three and a half, and Colorado at three and a half. That graphic is now outdated because, much to my glee and absolute pride and joy, the odds makers, maybe it's because a bunch of money came in. Maybe this show is so popular and my pro-Cal takes have just reached so many people that they came in and hammered the over and shifted the line. Maybe that's what happened. Or maybe the odds makers are seeing what I am seeing. Now, look, a game hasn't yet been played, so I can't take a full victory lap here. However... Cal's win total was four and a half. It's now five and a half. Now, if you don't follow sports gambling a lot, it is worth pointing out that moving a preseason win total in a 12-game season by one full game is a lot. So Cal has gone up to a five. I told you to bet it over four and a half a while ago. Now you can't get it over four and a half. You'd have to bet over five and a half. And that's risky. I loved four and a half, but at five and a half, I'd stay away. Because I could see, I'm, I'm probably going to pick them to be a 500 team or somewhere in that range. But five and a half, boy, that introduces a lot more risk for you as a gambler out there. Now, I like what Cal has done this offseason. It's why I am high on them, at least as high as you can be on Cal. I am bullish on Cal in that I think they will be over their preseason win total. Vegas also is starting to agree with that, which hmm. we'll see. We'll see if Vegas and I are right or if we're being completely misled by the Golden Bears. But I like that they brought in a new quarterback, a new OC, a new offensive line coach, and a good portal class. I like all of that. All of that tells me you could have a bounce back year. Plus, pressure on Justin Wilcox going into year seven. Back-to-back -back losing seasons. I know they've won the big game back-to-back -back years. But at some point, you got to get back to a bowl game there. Mm. Yes. So all those factors together, I like Cal. And now Vegas likes Cal. Now who's been dropped? The answer 
is that other team in the Bay Area. Stanford now has one of the lowest win totals in all of Power 5 football. It's two and a half. Do I think there's value on the over for a team that won three games a season ago? Could be. They lost a lot. They brought in some, but they can't bring in much via the portal because they're Stanford. However, two and a half is a very low total. You know who had a two and a half win total last year? Arizona. You know who I picked to go over last year? Arizona. You know who went over last year? Arizona. I haven't decided what I'm doing on Stanford yet. Once August rolls around, we will be doing my favorite summer shows of the year. And that is game by game record predictions for every Pac-12 team. I cannot wait. I cannot wait for those. But that comes in August. So if you want to get that content, wherever you're listening or watching right now, you got to subscribe. And then we can enjoy all that together, which we will. But anyway, I just thought that was noteworthy. I thought it was something that should be pointed out that someone other than myself thinks Cal might be a little bit better than people thought. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's ask a big question about a team. I like doing this too. I like asking big questions for the teams because we have 12 teams in this conference this year. I know, I know. We have 10 after this year, but we still have 12. And everybody's got a big question to answer. And Utah has got a big question to answer. So they're the two-time defending champs. They won the 2021 Pac-12 title in dominant fashion. They also kind of did that by the time the game ended in 2022. Didn't win either Rose Bowl. They got a lot of people back. One of those guys is Cam Rising. And I think the biggest question for Utah this year is not necessarily... Now, this was a, a debate of sorts at the Lockdown Network. My guy Brandon Olson at Lockdown Florida Gators and JT Wistersill, friend of the program at Lockdown Utes, they were in an exchange of sorts, completely friendly, surrounding whether or not Cam Rising would be healthy for week one. Because they play week one, August 31st, big game. Utah's a pretty big favorite, nine and a half points in Salt Lake City last time I checked, because they haven't lost there with fans in the stands since 2018 when Washington knocked them off. That was also a Pac-12 championship team in the Washington Huskies. So, Utah going into this season, has got Cam Rising back for year three as a starter and what will be his final year of eligibility before he likely goes and tries to get on an NFL roster, which I think he could do. But the biggest question for Utah this year, I don't think it's necessarily whether or not he'll be healthy for week one. That could be a question. Go check out JT and he'll, t- he'll tell you all about that sort of stuff. I think the biggest question is whether or not he stays healthy. Because when players are managing injuries, when they're nursing them, when they're recovering, a lot of times they can be ready to play. But then a lot of times they aren't themselves. This can happen in football. This can happen in baseball. This can happen in golf. This can happen in basketball. Some guys have an injury and are never the same. I'm not saying Cam Rising will be that. But at the very least... It is a question surrounding him. When you don't play in the spring game because of an injury, it is fair to wonder, how is that going to impact the season? And we know that Utah is a really good football team because we've seen that the last couple of years. And I think their win total would be nine and a half if they had a schedule like the ones that Oregon, Washington, and USC have. Utah has a tougher schedule. They have two power five opponents in their non-conference. Every other school only has one. USC's got Notre Dame, Washington has Michigan State, and Oregon's got Texas Tech. Now, the best team of that bunch is probably Notre Dame. I wouldn't sleep on Texas Tech. I wouldn't sleep on Baylor either, being the best of that bunch. But nobody else has to play two. If Utah's schedule was Florida at home, and then they played a Mountain West school at home, say... I don't know. Pick one. Spencer, pick a Mountain West school. Just, 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 just pick one. You know, Fresno State, for instance. Eh, they're good. Utah State. Let's say they played Utah State. If they played Utah State instead of Baylor in Week Two, their win total would be nine and a half. I fully believe that. But because they have Baylor, it's eight and a half.
So if you're Utah going into this year, and you know that at your best, you are capable of winning the conference, having done so twice in a row, what has been among the biggest keys? Cam Rising. Heart and soul, leader, also happens to be a good quarterback and a productive player. And the question for Utah this year, the only question I have about them, the only question I have to ask as to whether the Utes can contend for a Pac-12 championship is, will Cam Rising give you 12 healthy games with nine specifically being the most important, the Pac-12 games that, that, that Utah will play this year? That's when you need him. That's when he's got to be there. Is he at 100% for all nine of those games? I don't know. I'm not trying to answer that question. I'm trying to give you context. I'm trying to pose the question or the thought of what's going to define whether or not Utah hits their ceiling this year. They have some serviceable, capable backups, but there are very few teams in the country, and I don't think there are any in the Pac-12 that go from a starter to a backup and have almost no drop-off. Only schools that can do that in the Pac-12 are ones that don't have a high level of quarterback play. You could go from Drew Pine to Jaden Rashad at Arizona State, not have a huge drop-off. You'd have some, but you might not have a massive drop-off. But that's because Drew Pine is a bottom third quarterback in the Pac-12. Every other place you go, that guy gets hurt. And look, I'm not, I'm not sitting here rooting or, or wanting Cam Rising to get hurt. Of course I don't want him to get hurt. But it's a question you got to ask. Because if I told you right now, Cam Rising in Pac-12 play, only plays seven games, and he's out for two. Plays the other seven and is able to be, you know, 90 to 100% of himself, and he looks like Cam Rising and everything's good and fine. Then Utah is going to have a chance to win every single one of those games, and they'll never be a huge underdog. But in the other two, the question would then become, if he, you know, gets dinged up and has to just kind of nurse it and sit out for a week, which happens, are you able to win that game if you're Utah? Are you going to be able? Who's it against? When are you playing them? How you been playing? What's the health of the rest of the team look like? That's the big question for Utah right now. We'll keep asking big questions about every Pac-12 team as time goes on. But that was my big question about Utah today. Is my big question for Utah. All right, let's uh, wrap up with a mailbag question. YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore Pac-12. DMs and mentions wide open. By the way, been getting a lot more questions recently. And I'm here for it, always. Forever and always, expansion, football, whatever, hit me up. This from NJ Bowl or NJ Bowl, I don't know. N-J-B-O-A-L, however you pronounce that. He asks, similar to the Saudi question, what if Phil Knight and or Nike tossed a bunch of money at the Pac-12 media deal? Could run with this in a bunch of different directions, but one thought is this could be useful in luring new Power 5 teams to the Pac. I, I, okay, I'll get to that. I know just enough about media contracts to know I have no clue how they work. <laughs> Love the honesty. Other than what I've learned from your show over the last few months. So maybe this makes no sense, but with the Saudi question, I thought I'd swing back to it. Appreciate you coming on every day. I know I'll see you next time, and until then, have a wonderful rest of your day. My man with... That is, that is a true everydayer right there. Ending the question the same way that I end the show every single day, my man is dedicated. I very much appreciate that. So the short answer to your question here is no, Phil Knight cannot come in and save the Pac-12, because... Phil Knight does not own a media entity. Now, if Phil Knight bought ESPN, like just as a hype, I'm not saying that's possible or going to happen, but if Phil Knight owned ESPN or if he owned Fox or if he bought Ion Television, my dream, or if he bought the CW or something like that, then it could be a factor. But an individual alone cannot support a media deal the way he can support an athletic department as he and Nike have done with Oregon for a long, long time now. So the question that he alluded to, asking the question here, NJ, NJ Bowl, NJ Boal, I don't know. Tell me how you're supposed to pronounce that. Anyway, 
the, the, what he alluded to earlier was the, the, the Saudi question. And that was, could the Saudis get involved in college sports one day? And my answer is, yeah, of course I could see that. I could see them coming in and probably being closer to Phil Knight than being a media entity because they don't, right? That's the reason, part of the reason they were willing to partner with the PGA Tour. PGA Tour had a great television contract. Liv had just an okay television contract, you know, having it all be on the CW. But I think that for 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 this sort of situation, I could see the Saudis coming in and saying, hey, blank athletic department, you seem short on money. We'd like to be involved. How would you like to take our money in and, and in return, we can be involved? Someone would say yes to that. I'm not saying everybody would. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's great. But look at where we're at. Look at what they have accomplished. Look at what they are doing and what they want to do. They've got Ronaldo in their soccer league. They, they've got a bunch of PGA stars or they, you know, they poached a bunch of them and then got back together with the merger and everything like that. They're willing to make moves. They're willing to push the envelope. They're willing to go where people don't think they can or should. So could they get involved? Yes. But on the media side of things, you're not dealing with individuals with money. It's, it's, it's not just go to a billionaire or go to, you know, mega billionaires, the Saudi PIF and have them fix the problem or have them, you know, throw money at the schools to support the deal or anything like that. Cause they don't get anything out of that. Right. So, you know, Phil Knight loves Oregon because Oregon is where Nike started. Like it started in the state, the headquarters are there. For people who do not know, you go back to, you know, Bill Bowerman and, and, and Phil and, you know, Steve Prefontaine running track at Oregon, everything like that. Like the, it was Blue Ribbon Sports, then it went into Nike, and now it is, you know, the uh, behemoth that it has become. But I don't think there's an incentive for Phil Knight to say, and, and, and you know, he has obviously so, so much money, but does he have enough money to, like, fill in the gap? Like, if, if the... If the media deal, let's say the media deal comes in at $30 million per school, I don't think Phil Knight would say, okay, each school is, you know, $35 million behind the, or $40 million, whatever it is, behind the Big Ten deal. I'll give you $20 million per school. That's still hundreds of millions of dollars. And I know that he's got a lot, like, like, like a lot, a lot, but I don't think he's going to just spread it around like that. And I don't think that his interests are, I mean, he wants the Pac-12, I think, to succeed. You know, he has ties to Stanford as well. He's given money there. I think he's given some money to Oregon State uh, as well. But I don't think he's got that sort of holistic approach. And I don't know what, you know, would necessarily be in it for him, right? Like he wants Oregon to win a national championship. So he wants Oregon to have an advantage over the other schools at, at some level. And he certainly provides that over over uh, some of the programs, as an Oregon has an advantage over some of the programs because Phil is so involved and wants Oregon to succeed at the highest level possible. So, going back to the question here, they 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 being wealthy individuals cannot just get involved with it because they don't have any power for what the Pac-12 is looking to do. Right? They're looking to have a a company bid on the rights for their broadcasts. And then to put those games on TV, Phil Knight and the Saudi PIF fund don't have any capacity to, to do that. The other thing you mentioned was, you know, it could be mentioned in luring new power five teams to the pack. I, I don't, I really struggle to see a world in which the Pac-12 adds power five schools. Like right now, 1000% no. Five, six years from now, 99.99% no. You know, like it would be more possible, but I talked about this on a, on a recent episode of the show. So many things would have to change and go the Pac-12's way. And when do things ever go our way? I mean, come on now, we're the Pac-12. For the Pac-12 to be a destination for ACC or Big 12 schools, and Big 12 would be the most likely, I, I, I just can't see that happening at this point in time. So I think we have to operate in a world of, Pac-12 needs to get the best deal possible, finish it up at San Diego State and SMU, and then for the next round, figure out who your best G5 additions are going to be at that time, whenever that is. 
But great question. Keep them coming. Got lots in the mailbag. Still pretty full. And I'm going to you know, continue to get through it as the week goes on. So hopefully you tune in. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And as you know, have a wonderful rest of your day.